Tonight on Ham Nation, announcing the 2020 AM Rally, reports from Randy and Gordo from Quartzfest, Arduino Spoken Solder Project from George, and a very important announcement for next week's episode. Ham Nation is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode 438 for January 29th, 2020. Preparing for the AM Rally. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ham Nation. This is a show all about ham radio. And tonight it's about some specialized ham radio, and we have some great guests. Gordo will be with us later on to talk about some Quartz Fest things. Randy has some video. George is out getting his uh, solder and smoke all together. Amanda's in here figuring out what the chat room's doing. So uh, they'll be around right after we get through talking about my favorite mode as well as these gentlemen you see with me. Let's see who all's here. First of all, we have from the ARRL and in the lab is Bob Allison. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm great, Bob. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, it seems like you were just here a few hours ago, which you were. <laughs> I was, yeah. I've been on the road for six days and uh, traveling and was uh, attended Winterfest in Collinsville, Colorado. Then I hightailed it out towards the Pittsburgh area. Oh, uh, Missouri. Uh, Collinsville, yeah, but I was at Missouri. And uh, then we hightailed it out to uh, Pittsburgh area, north of that, of the Mercer County Amateur Radio Club. And we spoke about the AM rally there, too, as well as a presentation on performance parameters that I measure here in the ARL laboratory. Yeah. You got to visit the one and only K3LR. Yes. I certainly did. And that was just absolutely incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm not sure if I ever will again. But uh, oh, Tim, sure was, yeah, Tim in was fact, he'll have you out and do it. He'll have you come it's, out and do a do a t- contest. That's even better. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I'll be up for something like that. Wow, that was some <laughs> station. And Tim and the and, DX engineering crew are great. Yeah, they are. And we yeah. have Steve with us tonight. Steve, how are you doing? You uh, all ready for the weekend and the big uh, AM rally? Yes, indeed. We're all ready for the AM rally. The servers are all set to go. The software is up on the site. And we're ready to go with the 2020 AM rally. Hopefully, we'll surpass last year's totals. We had uh, just under 1,000 individual call signs logged and 2,400 and something QSOs. So, it just keeps getting bigger each year. So, maybe yes. we'll top 3,000 this year. Who knows? Hey, that that would be fun. And we're going to get more and more Ham Nation viewers to push that AM button. Speaking of AM buttons, here's Brian. Hi, Brian. How are you? Hey, Bob. We're doing well. Thanks for having us on. What what a gorgeous transmitter. Uh, when you, uh, that button right beside you, you push that you button. Push this one right here? Right there. Push that AM button. <laughs> Look at that, baby. <laughs> there you okay. go. A 1951's yeah. Collins 300G. This is serial number 147. It's one of 150 made, and Where it was did rescued out of a. It was rescued out of a radio station in St. Augustine, Florida, by Paul W3VJB, um, WA3VJB. Let me get his call right. And a couple of other hams. It spent a few years at the Bowie Television Radio Museum, just up the road from me here in Bowie, Maryland. And uh, the museum went a different direction. Uh, they needed this space, so we rescued it from the museum, so to speak, and it's uh, been here for the last three years as we get it uh, tiled in real perfectly for 160 meters. 
Um, it's, it's, been, it's set up for 160 meters AM on uh, 1880 and 1885. So it's a lot of fun. Well, I love those stories. That's for sure. And Steve, you have all kinds of cool things behind you. Most all of that's homebrew, though, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, yep. The whole shack is, is homebrew. There are, oh, quite a few transmitters back there, but there are basically three three transmitters in this room, and they're all solid state. They look like antiques, but they're actually all modern, solid state, class E transmitters. So uh, that's that's what this is all about here. Oh, that's great. Your, your microphone is even special uh, because you've got that as a USB. You had to do a little work to get it to work like that, but uh, it certainly isn't the old crystal, that's for sure. No, this has a um, it has an electric um, condenser element inside of here, and then there's a little microprocessor I programmed in the base of it to do the USB protocol. And I've got some analog electronics, so this actually is plugged right into the computer USB. So mm -hmm. that's what it is. Oh, that's great! What's your favorite piece out of all those behind you? Oh, I I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> Hard to say. Probably this transmitter right here. This is a uh, that's my old standby transitive. I built this back in 2001, and I'm still using it. Oh, that's great. Well, I hear it, and I've worked you many times, and it, uh, it always sounds great. And then we move up to the ARRL headquarters, and Bob, you're with the Gates BC-1, right? Tell us a little bit about that <clears throat> little deal. Sure. That's uh, right behind me. Uh, over that way. There it is, the BC-1T. And that also was rescued from the National Capital Radio and Television Museum in, in Bowie, Maryland. And we went down there and picked this up. It was a real wreck when we got it. All the iron was out of it. But they gave us plenty of iron. We crossed our fingers and hopefully we had all the uh, right pieces. And the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut restored the Gates BC-1T behind me to its original broadcast configuration. And then uh, after that was stable, we ran it for a whole week. We had Tim Tron, Tim Smith, WA1HLR, come here and convert it over to 75 meters and 160. So it runs like a champ. And last year it was used in the AM rally, and we made 392 contacts with it. Wow. Well, it, uh, it's a beautiful piece. And that's, that's part of this whole thing uh, uh, for those of you uh, that don't have vintage gear uh, you really need to do that. This is, to me, is the foundation of ham radio. And, uh, yeah, you can do uh, uh, over my shoulder uh, some of the, the 430, 70, 7610, uh, 7851, all this kind of stuff. It's a lot of fun. But right above my head, little Drake 2B and. Uh, right beside it's the Marv's. And then uh, over to the other side is the pine board that uh, many of you built here in the last year. Or so that's the fun of it. And uh, don't ever say, well, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. It's It really is quite easy. And there's a lot of yeah. help out there. Uh, Bob, I'm sure you, uh, you help a lot get uh, their soldering irons hot, don't you? Absolutely. And... Uh that pine board project is great, and you gave us one. We have it in a special display case here in the laboratory for all the uh, visitors to ARL headquarters to see. And it's autographed by you, and it's a very, very special piece. And thank you for that. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun here in the lab. We're going to have a great operation. We'll have the gates going. We have the uh, equipment that you donated to the ARL back in 2004. It's the NC-303 and the Johnson Valiant transmitter, you and Joe Walsh. That's going to be set up on 160. And then we have the K7DYY transmitter. It's a solid state class demodulated transmitter. And we have that set up for 40 meter operation. And then we have a couple other radios ready to go. And uh, we'll also be on six meters on 50.4. It's going to be a lot of fun. Not to mention the high class operators we're going to have here. We're going to have a, quite a crowd. Um, and you're going to hear some very melodious voices. And some YLs are going to be operating our transmitters. That should attract some attention. Yeah, and show, absolutely. And show that women have uh, great abilities to communicate, <clears throat> and they're just going to have just as much fun as the guys will have here at, uh, at the AR laboratory. That's right. Well, we have a, 
a little graph here. Uh, Victor can bring that up and show a little bit about when and where and why about what's going on with the uh, the rally this uh, this weekend. And I, I hope that uh, many of you will do as uh, <laughs> as Brian did there, push the AM button on your transmitter because yep. all of these new transmitters they sound great on AM. Absolutely, yes. So yeah. give it a shot. Absolutely. <clears throat> and here's some of the uh, details uh, of the rally, and you can uh, go into the website and uh, look at some of the. Uh, the ideas and stuff that's going on. and But the main thing is, is that uh, on uh, Friday, it starts and then it goes through Sunday. So you want to take, uh, take note of all of that. And uh, uh, Steve, do you have any, uh, any ideas or things you want to add to the, uh, to the <coughs> chart uh, where the rally is going? Um, let's see. The only thing I can say is just go to AM Rally. <clears throat> excuse me, amrally.com. So it's just a m r a l l y dot com. Everything is there. It's a this is a fun event. I mean, it just is fun. It's not high pressure. It's not really a contest. It's more of an event. Yes, people can send in logs, and there are actually winners. Oh, by the way, a little known piece, a little known factoid: the second one of these, uh, the AM Rally, way back when. Uh, Carrie, KC2UFU, won, and she's a YL, and she uh, she actually won it that year, and phenomenal performance. She just lived in the chair, according to her husband, and she is coming up to the league, as far as I know, this weekend, so uh, it's going to be great fun. So, yeah, go to the website if you need to know more, amrally.com. It starts at 7 o'clock Eastern Time on Friday, goes to 2 a.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, and it's a, it's really a fun event. Absolutely. And again, I, I want to encourage you, even if you've never been on AM, your transmitter will work there. You just push the AM button and magic happens. And uh, it's a wonderful place. And uh, it's always a, a fun group, a gentlemanly group. They don't get in any kind of wars or arguments and stuff like that. that you find on other modes. We just have fun with AM radio. Uh, Brian, how long have you been on AM? I've been on AM since I since I got my ticket, Bob. So quite some time. Uh, I actually came across Steve and the guys on 80 meters there and just fell in love with it. And uh, had I known that AM was available to me many years ago, I probably would have gotten into AM radio much much sooner. Uh, it's a great hobby. It's technically challenging to get the audio right and the antenna systems right. So it's 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 a push. And and why you see why everybody sees my gates or my Collins here and, and the gates at uh, the league and Steve's equipment in the back, uh, a Kenwood TS four thousand, a Flex, uh, uh, an Icom, a Yesu, any of those rigs when set up properly can sound fantastic on AM. So anybody that has a radio that has an AM button on it, please jump in the, the event this weekend and join us. The ladies will be on the air Saturday night. We're dubbing it as Ladies Night. Um, it's really a fun event, Bob. We've had so much success with the AM rally that other events are picking up. Last weekend was the AM QSO party in Europe, and uh, they've done well. We have the AM rally this weekend. Two weeks from now, there's a bye weekend next weekend, but the weekend after that is the AWA AM QSO party here in the United States. So it's really gaining a lot of interest. There's a lot of great guys and gals that uh, it's a rag chew type of thing. You'll hear Steve run some nets on, on 80 meters and on 160. Uh, most of the guys and gals will sit around and just chew the rag. Uh, and, and there's some directed uh, uh, round tables. But other than that, it's just a good old time to be on AM, and it's fun to play with some of these old transmitters. I have one of Steve's uh, e-rigs up in, in my uh, main shack upstairs that we use, and uh, we use other equipment uh, on, on AM as well. So there, it's so much fun to play with and, and dial in different frequencies. You'll hear us on 160, 80, 40, uh, 20 meters. Uh, you'll usually find us about uh, 100 and, or 1885 and uh, 3885 and 7285. So it's been a lot of fun. Bob Allison and the ARRL has been a great host, and we're looking forward to helping them uh, showcase the ladies on Saturday night. 
All right. Well, we're going to look forward to catching up with you. And Steve, you have any uh, parting words or any uh, uh, any advice uh, other than push the AM button? No, nope. push the AM button and have a lot of fun. The ICOM 7300 uh, one year was the most popular transmitter on the AM rally, uh, a high percentage, you know, like maybe 5%, which is a lot using one transmitter, had that transmitter, and it's they sound perfect on A, and push the button, they just work. Yes, absolutely. Well, Robert, I'm uh, glad that you made it back to the league in time after leaving us here uh, on a great weekend in uh, Collinsville, and uh, I guess you'll have a bunch at the league, so we'll be looking for W1AW, that's for sure. You bet. And we'll have a, a nice crowd on hand here. And my favorite part is hearing all the cool old radios, like the old broadcast transmitters. But how about the BC-610 or an ART-13, the old military equipment? is always great to hear. But no matter what radio you're running, try it out. Try AM. If, you, if you've never done AM before, just press the button, and uh, we'll be listening for you very, very carefully. And uh, everyone's just going to have a blast. It's, it's a low-key operating event. It's friendly. No one bites you. And uh, it's all about having fun. That's right. And be sure that you observe the AM window. That's very important. Uh, on 75 meters, it's 3870 to 3890. On 40 meters, 7290 to 7295. So on, you want to make sure that you stay in those windows because we, uh, for years, have uh, really tried to keep that the foundation of AM so that we don't get in trouble and uh, QRMing the sidebanders and likewise them to us. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for being here, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all this weekend on the AM rally, and uh, hopefully we'll. <coughs> Come back in a few weeks, have some scores. That'd be good. Yep, I'll have the results. Yep. All right, excellent. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Thanks we'll to look all to of you. And everybody. Yeah, we'll see you this weekend. Have fun, okay? Yep. Absolutely. We'll see all everybody right, see this weekend. Take care. All right, <laughs> have fun on AM. What else would you want to do? <laughs> oh, that's great. But talk about things. Look at this. Wait a minute. I got to show you. I have one of my transmitters that decided not to work. Guess what? The VFO said, I'm not going to do this anymore. So if anybody wants to know what I'm doing the rest of the night, I'm going to get in here and fix this little booger. Uh, it's got a power supply problem, and I know exactly what's happening. That thing is uh, 1959, and it's original. And uh, guess what? It's going to need some new capacitors. But by midnight, that baby will be honking. But see, that's the fun of AM. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm really glad to have all my friends here. And we're glad that all of you are watching. And hopefully we'll work you this weekend, too. Uh, Robert just left TX Engineering. He had a really nice weekend uh, here in, uh, in the St. Louis area with us. Got to fire up the organ and all that. Then he went to DX Engineering, so he uh, he can give us a first-hand clue of what happens. But let me tell you, this is the dealer. So let's hear what kind of specials DX Engineering has for us tonight. One of the great things about DX Engineering, and there are many, is that they're a one-stop source for everything about ham radio. Whether you're operating in the shack, out on the field, even in the tightest spaces, and with that in mind, here are three new products that cover the whole spectrum. For the portable op who wants to travel with as little weight as possible, DX Engineering offers Soda Beam's Carbon 6 Compact Ultralight Telescopic Mast. This mast extends to 19 feet but collapses to just 17 inches, so it's easy to transport in a backpack. Smooth, telescoping, mast, 18 sections, allows for fast deployment. It's made from carbon fiber, so it weighs only 10.6 ounces, and it makes a good choice for supporting the center of lightweight in-fed wire antennas. Now, for the operator who wants a unique listening experience in the shack, there's Phonema's Oscar Overhead Sphere Speaker. It's a cool, futuristic-looking 7.1-inch diameter sphere-shaped speaker, and it's designed to hang above the desk and envelope the operator in sound. And it's a good space saver. 
The directivity of the 8-ohm 25-watt speaker helps keep radio sounds inside the shack, producing a warm audio that can improve mental concentration on signals and reduce fatigue. Sounds like a great contest uh, accessory, doesn't it? It's a great accessory for comfortable operating in any mode or even listening to broadcast radio like WTWW on the shortwave. DX Engineering also has added three new rugged 46-inch tall ham R antennas to its lineup from Compact Tenna. They provide superior omnidirectional coverage and can fit just about anywhere, even in an attic. The Ham R7 Digi antenna covers CW and digital segments of 40, 20, and 10 meter phone band and all of the 6, 2, 1 and a quarter meter and 70 centimeter bands. The Ham R7 Wark antenna covers 30, 17, 12, 6, 2, 1 and a quarter and 70 centimeters. The Ham R7 antenna covers phone segments of 40, 20, and 10 meter phone bands and all of the 6, 2, 1 and a quarter and 70 centimeter bands. These proven stealth antennas are also ideal for traveling hams or for outdoor portable use. DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern are shipped the same day. With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 2204, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, January 29th, 2020. In our top story this week, a new chief executive is in place at the American Radio Relay League. In a move that has generated a buzz throughout some of the amateur community, the board of the American Radio Relay League voted against re-electing Howard Mickle, WB2ITX, as chief executive officer. Effective Monday, January 20th, Barry Shelley, N1VXY, became interim CEO of the league. This is Barry Shelley's second term as interim CEO. The league's chief financial officer for 28 years, he was also chosen as interim CEO following the retirement of Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, in 2018. Howard Mickle's short tenure as CEO began in October of 2018. As speculation continues on a successor, a search committee has been created to review candidates. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Ralph Squillace, KK6 ITB. As modern as SDR may be, amateurs still appreciate radio's legacy. In this case, its earliest voice mode. Get ready for a rally on AM. Ham radio operators are getting a chance to turn back time, at least for a little while, between the 1st and 3rd of February during the 4th Annual AM Rally. It doesn't matter whether your rig is a new piece of SDR equipment or a homebrew rig with vacuum tubes, a trusty old boat anchor, or something somewhere in between. It also doesn't matter whether you get on 160 meters, 6 meters, or any of the amateur frequencies in between. You can run as few as 5 watts or take your power to the legal limit. This event is all about celebrating amplitude modulation and celebrating the hams who opt in for the fun of it on that weekend. In addition to awards in different categories, there will also be a special recognition for the longest transmission heard, lowest power used, most unique equipment, and working W1AW, the headquarters stations for ARRL, one of the sponsors along with Radio Engineering Associates and INET Radio. Visit the website amrally.com for more details. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. In our final story this week, we ask, what extremes would you go to to get your hands on an old radio? Newsline anchor Stephen Kinford picks up the story. If that radio is the wireless transmitter that operator Jack Phillips used on April 15, 1912 to summon help for the doomed RMS Titanic, those extremes likely include ocean depths. The United States company that has salvage rights to the wreckage is ready to make that trip, and soon. It's asking a U.S. Department Corps judge in eastern Virginia to approve an undersea expedition to the ship's interior to retrieve the Marconi transmitter that summoned the RMS Carpathia. It sent the message, quote, Come at once. We have struck a berg. It's a CQD, old man. End quote. In an agreement reached recently between the two countries, Britain and the United States, both have the authority to grant or refuse permission for such missions. RMS Titanic Incorporated, the U.S. company hoping to make the trip, noted in its court papers that while the radio room itself has stayed somewhat unscathed, holes are forming in the deck house directly above it, placing the Marconi set in peril. The Washington Post said that Park Stevenson, a Titanic expert, called the transmitter the world's most famous radio. 
And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Ralph Squalacci, KK6ITB, Jack Parker, W8ISH, Stephen Kenford, N8WB, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, ae 5 dw 73 We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation Now. Here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We have an Earth-directed solar storm that could bring us more aurora and not one, but two new active regions on the Earth-facing sun come out to play. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week started out quiet, but it sure didn't stay that way. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see everything was pretty bland until we started seeing a new sunspot emerge on the Earth-facing disk. This region ended up being one of the biggest sunspots we've seen in quite some time, and you can see it fizzling and farting there. This became named region 2757, and on the 25th, it fires off an Earth-directed solar storm. It's kind of hard to see here, and we had to wait for the models to kind of get an idea of when it's going to hit Earth. Right now, it looks like it's going to hit Earth right about the 29th, but it's probably going to be a pretty weak storm. You know, we're not that far from solar minimum, so these storms aren't all that strong yet. But hey, who cares? We're seeing these solar storms being launched far more frequently. And as activity continues to ramp up, these storms are going to get stronger. But believe it or not, this is not the only story. We also have a new bright region that's rotating into Earth view on the sun's uh, southeast limb. This is a solar cycle 25 sunspot. It's a new cycle sunspot, and or it's actually a bra active region. It didn't last uh, as a sunspot all that long, so it's probably not going to get a designation from NOAA. You know, these new cycle sunspots have a tendency to be a bit shy. They kind of poke out uh, onto the surface of the sun and then dive back down. So we're going to have to deal with these being bright regions for quite some time yet. Now, as we switch to our far-sighted sun, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see that active region kind of emerging uh, in the center of the disk in the south. Now this region is helping to boost the solar flux. We are now back into the balmy 70s uh, for emergency radio communications and amateur radio operators. But luckily this region is not doing any serious flaring. So we don't have to worry about radio blackouts or anything like that for space launch affecting communications or any other types of space traffic. Switching to our moon, we are now coming out of a new moon on our way to a first quarter, and by the first, the moon will be about 40% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to check those dim objects in the sky, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that earthward directed solar storm and it should be hitting us around the 29th. Now we're not expecting a big impact, but at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions with up to about a 25% chance of a major storm. Now mid latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 20% chance for active conditions. And this may be followed by a little pocket of fast solar wind, which could enhance things just a little bit and make it last a little while. But nonetheless, as we approach through the and get through the weekend, things should settle down. And so Aurora photographers, if you're going to catch this, you're going to have to stay on your toes. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we do have a couple bright regions on the Earth-facing disk, but they're really not firing off any big flares. I think we've seen a couple B-class flares, but outside of that, not much else. So everything is in the green when it comes to big solar flares. We have no risk for radio blackouts, and that should make GPS users and anyone dealing with radio communications for launch or for any type of space traffic, that should make you very happy. No risk for that on Earth's day side. But because we do have a couple bright regions, in fact, we have region 2757 on the Earth-facing disk right now. It has been boosting the solar flux. Look at that. We're back up into the mid-70s, the balmy 70s for solar flux. And this should make amateur radio operators extremely happy. You should be able to be getting a little bit better uh, radio propagation, even on some bands that have been pretty bad as of late. And these conditions will last on Earth's day side easily over the next week. So enjoy. 
enjoy. Now, also because we are at solar minimum, we are getting a higher cosmic ray impingement than we normally would have. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high altitudes and high latitudes, you all are in the moderate range for radiation dose. And this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week started out quiet, but it's sure not going to end that way. We have two bright regions on the Earth-facing disk, and one of them has even fired off an Earth-directed solar storm. And that should be hitting us in and around the 29th, and it could bring aurora down to mid-latitudes, but definitely should get some aurora show at high latitudes. So your aurora photographers, stay on your toes, because this could be a decent chance to get a little something. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you ought to be loving life right now. The two bright regions on the Earth-facing disk have brought the solar flux up into the mid-70s. When was the last time we saw that? So this brings us up to marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side, and you should be able to get and enjoy some, some decent propagation, even on bands that you haven't been able to use very much as of late. And these trends will continue easily over the next week before things begin to fizzle down. Now, GPS users, well, you guys should also be loving things uh, on the day side of Earth is everything is still pretty quiet. But when that solar storm hits on the 29th, be sure to stay away from the dawn dust terminators and stay away from Aurora if you want your GPS reception to remain top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Well, thank you, Tamitha. Great report and great news that this weekend will be a great one for AM comms as well. Well, this didn't come directly from the sun. Actually, it came out of the ground at Quartzsite, Arizona during the 2020 Quartz Fest. And Randy was there the whole time with his team, K7AGE, getting some great short shots turned in the videos. So, Victor, let's go ahead and roll the Randy report. CQ, 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 Whiskey 7, Quebec. CQ, CQ, CQ. And MFJ has donated a cobweb antenna to the special event station. And they have a dipole or an inverted V strung up here. The solar panels will work a little better here once, once the earth rotates and the sun is able to light the panels. And we're over at the wind systems area where they're going to be doing uh, testing here today for licenses yeah. and Gordo and his crew are, got everything uh, set up here. To become... Good morning Gordo, what's happening? Well we have about uh, 40 folks taking examinations for their ham radio entry license, general and extra upgrade as well as over here we have these folks taking the commercial radio telephone along with code for commercial uh, as well as uh, radar and um, the code written. So exams are going well and thanks to the wind system for giving us this uh, spot for our exams at Court Fest 2020. Everybody gonna pass? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what are we taking? Technicians? Oh. Yes. Generals? Yes. All, of them. All of them. And some commercials over there. And some commercials. All right. Good. Lots of antennas out here at Quartzfest. Here's another uh, real nice mask in the back of this RV. More antennas. And lots of solar. Somewhere simple, just a panel leading up against the RV to rather more elaborate solar systems. Silent power, 4,860 watts. Panels on the sides, on the roof, and the ones on the opposite side can be pushed up so that they're all catching the sun. And some of the controllers here that are inside. He's using uh, cells that he's picked up from eBay from electric cars. This is Chris, KR1 SS, SS Hi. the organizer for Quartz Fest. And what's the head count? 
Well, at closing or at, uh, at the end of yesterday, we had 671. 671, end of Tuesday, okay. And right now we've had probably 40 to 50 people sign in this morning. So we're about seven and a quarter, roughly. Cool. We're 80 below where we were last year, but we still got a heck of a turnout. That's right. Okay, thank you. And this is the main fire pit ring, so we're getting set up here for the next session. Starting off yeah. on a solar discussion. Controllers and panels. So hi again, my name is Ryan. I'm with Blue Sky Energy Solar Charge Controllers and Jenison Solar Charge Controllers. Versus or Army Medics or have some kind of other, or been to maybe other South Wing classes that... And so what they discovered was you know, conventional wisdom years back was tourniquet was absolutely the last resort. How many of you had that training where, where you were told you don't put a tourniquet on unless it is the very last resort? That is not the case. Here's anymore. the bulletin board at Quartz Fest to keep up with all the activities that are going on and the latest scheduling. Hey, here's Kevin. W I've I forget your call. KB9RLW. KB9RLW. And your channel is? Uh, the Old Tech Guy on YouTube. The Old Tech Guy. But just uh, search for my call. You'll find it right away. Okay. So he's got his loop out here. Yep. And his Chinese radio. Yep. Get out of the shadow here. Are you yep. working anything? Well, yesterday I worked a guy in Wisconsin on uh, 20 meters. And then I checked into the Ole Miss net on 40 meters while I was walking around. Cool. The fellow in Wisconsin was quite surprised. He said I was his first pedestrian mobile. Wow. Very good. Thank you. Sure. So this is part of the area that I'm set up in. We have Bobby with his pneumatic mask with a tri-bander and multi-band uh, vertical on top. And Bobby's homebrew this solar tracking array completely himself, all the mechanical and all the software. It's 400 watts. And this is the sensor that's uh, looking at the sun. And when it's pointed at the sun, you basically have equal voltages coming out of the sensor there on, on all four of them. And that goes into an Arduino that he's done all the software on. And the back side here with the controller and the, the motors, this the track. So yeah, every couple minutes, it takes and uh, tilts the panels to follow the sun. Yeah. <laughs> First year at Quartz Fest? It is. And you just got your technician here. Technician computer. and and general. And general. That's right. A couple days ago. What's your call? That I gotta think about. <laughs> KJ7 LPO. <laughs> That's great, Mike. All right. So as you can see, we had a great time at uh, Quartz Fest, and in two weeks from uh, tonight, we're going to show you all the activities when we burned the ham uh, man and the ham woman. Uh, it was a giant bonfire, and we'll have both video as well as uh, some short shots. Quartz Fest was a huge success, only one day of a little bit of drizzle, maybe one drop, Cold in the morning, but nice and warm in the afternoon. Well, let's take a couple more looks at the short shots for Quartz Fest, and then we're going to go over to George. First of all, we did a seminar on tropospheric ducting, and who would know that we would have a day that Tropo came to Quartz Fest, and we were hearing signals uh, from Yuma. We were hearing them all the way north to Las Vegas, all on VHF and UHF. So the Tropo, as you can see, was great. <clears throat> Ladies, yes, you had your own tent, and uh, it was constantly filled with ladies uh, talking technical, ladies doing all of the great activities planned, and uh, one of them was cast iron cooking, and uh, we'll give you the full story on uh, cast iron cooking, but uh, it was, as you can see here, um, uh, eye appealing and uh, mouth watering. 
Um, and of course, I was working on my uh, book the whole time. Very happy to report that uh, the extra class book uh, question pool for uh, the remainder of uh, uh, this session, the extra class pool will come out on July 1. And um, that's uh, our testing team. And John and Tina and Dave and Susie uh, uh, going over all the exams. We had plenty of exams there. <clears throat> and uh, there's Marilyn. She's the one that, uh, and Aaron uh, has uh, the burning ham man. But we're going to save that for two more weeks. Uh, next week is ladies' night here on Ham Nation. But it's week after next, and we'll actually show it going up. But the best part of this was we seeded some of the sand with little Little teeny gold nuggets and as you can see with a smile on Marilyn's face as well as the smile on those gold prospectors they were delighted when they hit the uh, uh, the gold bands and saw some uh, bright uh, uh, gold coming through bio no batteries they were just working like a champ in fact that's the 100 amp year on the left and that's a 40 amp year uh, uh, center screen and uh, someone brought over their bio no 40 and we charged it off of the 100 and it just charged up fine that's a special event station and uh, all of the activities there um, the tents and the audio system, thanks to Gary, the audio was just great. And uh, speakers were all over the place with concurrent seminars. Uh, there's uh, some of the Road Trek uh, comm uh, units uh, on scene. And um, let me tell you, <laughs> working uh, halfway across the country with about two watts of power and uh, the loop, I was very impressed. You betcha. <laughs> and uh, Marilyn had uh, the right outfit. She's got her goggles. She's got her electric um, uh, go machine and her chair. And uh, it was fun. Everybody had just a super time at Quartz Fest. And that's Tracy. Uh, Tracy was constantly on the air. And, you know, it was so amazing. Amazing at Quartz Fest. Everybody was on the air. Nobody got mad when they desent the other person on FM or uh, caused uh, their receivers to nearly smoke uh, when they were transmitting uh, uh, medium power on HF. And uh, it was amazing that everybody just had a wonderful time at uh, Quartz Fest. And again, that tropo was unbelievable. It carried our VHF and UHF signals hundreds of miles just for a few hours that morning as the tropo was uh, building up. And uh, this was a great tropo shot from Alex in 6 ALX from his drone. And look at the area that we spread out on Quartz Fest had plenty of room, plenty of activity for all of the excitement. So that's what we did the last week or so. And again, we're getting close to uh, finishing up on the new extra class question pool. And uh, for those that are thinking of going for extra class, the pool used to be 712 questions. But as of July 1st, it's going down to 624, which will include 45 new questions that aren't really uh, uh, brand, brand new, but uh, new technology and 43 questions that got tossed that was old technology. So the question pool committee, Larry with the W5YI group heading it up, did a great job of getting uh, all the questions uh, cleaned up. And uh, Peter at Master Publishing is getting them all typeset and uh, well illustrated. So for those of you going for extra, if you got uh, the current book, uh, uh, go for it now. But uh, come July 1, it's certainly not going to be really any harder, actually a little bit easier uh, with the question pool going from 700 questions down to 600. So that's my story. And that's my uh, quartz crystal. They were everywhere just walking around the premise you couldn't help but bump into and pick up one of these neat quartz crystals so gordo here wb6noa george how are you doing and what'd you do this past weekend or so george well i went to a ham fest here gordo and i had a good time and i got some good stuff but I still don't think it's as much fun as you probably had at Quartz Fest. <laughs> Boy, I have got to make it out there one year. Absolutely. And, and I wanted it to be this year, but, you know, just, uh, well, didn't happen. So 
I don't know. I can always shoot for next year. But, wow. What what a fun event that looks like there. Well, you know, the last few weeks we have been talking about uh, the Arduinos and getting started with Arduino. I was at a ham fest this weekend, as I, I just mentioned. And, I, you know, a lot of people mentioned it to me, you know, what's uh, what's going on there? Or they said, I saw your thing on the Raspberry. No, you didn't see my thing on the Raspberry because I'm, I'm not doing one on the Raspberry right now. This this is a Raspberry Pi, though. This is a Raspberry Pi 4. This is an Arduino. They're, they're two completely different things. Now, you could do some of the same things on one of these you could do on the other. The Raspberry Pi, though, is a single board computer. It runs an operating system. It runs a version of Linux or, uh, you know, a couple other operating systems that are available. This is a microcontroller. It is purpose-driven to do the task that you assign it, and it doesn't do anything else. It's not multitasking like an Arduino doesn't run an operating system. If you've got something that needs to be robust, though, if you built your project on this, it's less likely to crash than it would be on, you know, a computer with an operating system on it. But both have their place. We're talking about the Arduino right now, a microcontroller. So let's pick back up this week. We're going to get a little bit more into just... Just what are the pins on here, and, and what does this board do? This is part two of our series on getting started with Arduino, the I.O. pins. Let's take a look at the schematic for an Arduino first. Just touch on a couple of things on there. Let's start at the heart. This is the ATmega 328P microcontroller chip. Everything else here is just to support that chip. If we start over here on the left-hand side, here's the USB port. That connects to this USB to serial converter right here. That chip translates the USB signals into serial data that the Arduino can read. Down here at the bottom is a 5-volt regulator circuit. We can power the Arduino three different ways. We can power it through the USB port. We can put power in the coaxial power connector, or we can connect 5 volts DC to the VN pin. Any of those will work. Another important component here, although not required, is the crystal. This is a 16 megahertz crystal that sets the clock frequency for the Arduino. Now, there's a clock built into the chip here itself. If you didn't have this crystal, the Arduino could still clock itself. It's just a little bit more accurate with the crystal. That's pretty much it. The others are just support components, minor things to make the circuit work. So there's not that many pieces to the Arduino itself. You'll notice all these pins here. We're going to take a little closer look at these and how you might use these in your projects. Here's a drawing of the various pins on the Arduino Uno. Start out at the top here. We see the ATmega328 microcontroller chip right there and the pins on either side, and they're all labeled here as to what they are, but you'll notice there's several different descriptions on each pin. The pin numbers here on the Arduino itself are not the same as the pin numbers on the connectors on the edges of the board. First, let me mention this reset button right here. Whenever it's pressed, it initializes or reboots the Arduino, and it runs a program that's loaded into it. If you've got a program and it needs to start over, hit the reset button and it'll begin at the beginning and execute any actions that are necessary. Let's zoom in and take a look at the top right-hand corner of the board. There's a reset button we were just talking about. Below that, there are a few pins here. These first two we're not really going to be concerned with because it's not really something that we're going to use ourselves. The AREF pin is where we can supply an analog reference voltage to the Arduino. 
This would be used, say, if we were using the analog to digital converters in the Arduino and wanted to set a specific voltage as a reference. It's got to be somewhere between 0 and 5. Say uh, we wanted to use 3.3 volts. We could feed a nice, clean 3.3 volts in on that pin right there. And then all the measurements the Arduino takes would be referenced against that as being maximum. Looking just below that is the ground pin. We'll scroll down the page a bit. There's the ground we were just looking at. Below that are the digital pins. We'll begin with the bottom two here. That's digital I.O. 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, starting at the bottom. And these can be used for more than one purpose. They can all be used as digital inputs, or you can select them as digital outputs, depending on whether you want to receive a signal into the Arduino or if you want to send a signal out of the Arduino. The bottom two here, 0 and 1, are used for RX and TX. That's used with the USB program, and it's communicating with a computer, so you may want to skip using those. You could use them, though, if you did not need the USB port in your project. Right above that, digital I.O. number 2, pin 2 on the board, matches with pin 2 in this list of numbers. All of these numbers right here in the violet correspond with the pin numbers on the Arduino. These other numbers have different meanings. We're only going to cover the ones that you'll be interested in here. Pin 3 gives us another digital I.O., this pin can also be used for PWM, or pulse with modulated signals. That's something that we'll perhaps cover in a later lesson. You can use it just for regular digital input or output, though, if you don't need a lot of PWM ports on your project. Pin 4 is just another digital I.O. pin. Of course, there's other functions, too, but we're not concerned with those. Pin 5, another digital I.O. pin that can also do PWM. Pin 6 is the same thing, another digital I.O. with the option to use it as a PWM signal. These are pulse with modulated outputs, not inputs. Pin 7 is another digital I.O. Pin 8, also normal digital I.O. And then pins 9, 10, and 11 all have PWM sending capabilities. Pin number 12 and 13 are normal digital I.O. pins. They also have other functions over here that we're not going to cover. That won't be necessary in the lessons that we'll have here. Now, just because these have PWM signals does not mean you can't use them as regular digital inputs or digital outputs. It just means they also have the capability of doing that if you need that function. Let's look over at the left-hand side of the board now. We will start once again at the bottom and work our way up. The bottom six pins here are all analog inputs. A0 going down to A5. These have an A to D converter on each pin. We can send analog voltages from 0 to 5 volts into any one or more of these pins and convert that to a digital number that we can use in our programs. These pins also have a few other functions that won't be necessary to anything that we're doing here. Above that is the VN pin. This is where you can put 5 volts on the side of the Arduino and use that as your power source. We've got a couple of ground connectors right above that. Then we've got a 5 volt connector right above that where we can get 5 volts regulated from the Arduino to use for our switches or various other circuits we're connecting to the Arduino. Above that, there is a 3.3 volt pin there where we could get a 3.3 volt out. Then the reset pin here works the same as the reset push button, but we might want to extend that out to uh, a push button on the outside of our case or any number of things. And then there's an I.O. reference pin here. The I.O. ref pin gives us a reference to determine if this particular Arduino model operates with 5 volt logic or whether it's using 3.3 volts for its logic. 
The Arduino Uno will have 5 volts here, but some of the other models would only have 3.3 volts. That covers most of the functions of these pins, at least the ones that we're going to be interested in for our projects. Boy, I, I started a real debate or discussion going in the chat room there on that one when I said it doesn't have an operating system. Some people say it does. Some people say it doesn't. It has a bootloader. It does load in uh, code that is the basis of everything it does with that bootloader. Uh, we're some debate as to whether you call that an operating system or not. But really, that's going to be beyond the scope of what we're trying to to discuss here. Just think of it this way. The likelihoods of this Arduino crashing compared to this Raspberry Pi are not remotely the same. These are these are microcontrollers. They're pretty robust. Now, there's a lot of different microcontrollers out there. Uh, I noticed some people said they like to pick microcontrollers, and those are very good and very popular as well. This one currently, though, probably is the most popular because it was released as an open source project. And there's just so much stuff out there for it. Now, there is for the PICs as well, but this is super popular at uh, this time in history. And there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of support. Uh, it's very user-friendly, easy, probably a little easier to get started with than some of the others. So that's the reason I, I'm recommending it. I have used others, um, but... I don't know. I, I really kind of like the Arduinos. They're they're very easy to get going with, and there's so much code already written for them out there. But, you know, by all means, try your hands at uh, whichever one you'd like. And we're going to be back in just a moment. But first, let's get a message from ICOM. New Year, new savings. Bring in the new year loud and clear with some of ICOM's most innovative products. Check out the ICOM America website for current promotions on ICOM 7610, 7300, and 9700. Start the year off right with the high-performance IC7610, a direct sampling transceiver that will change the world's definition of SDR. It has the ability to pick out the faintest signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. RF Direct Sampling System, 110 RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. With the IC7300, ICOM is changing the way entry-level HF is designed. High-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. RF Direct Sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The IC9700 was built with the VHF-UHF weak signal operator in mind. Faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. ICOM's IC9700 is the pinnacle of perfection. 4.3-inch color touchscreen, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode, Real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, voice recording playback functions with SD memory card, supports CW, AM, FM, single sideband RIDI, and D-Star DV and DD modes. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information and current promotions on ICOM 7610, 7300, and 9700. And ICOM invites you to enter in the weekly drawings for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. And when you do, you'll automatically be registered for the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. How do you do that? Well, you go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and register right there. For January, we've got a great prize here. It's the ICOM ID5100A Deluxe Dual Band Dual Watch Mobile with touchscreen. It's FM or D Star dual watch receivers, built in GPS, large 5.5 touchscreen display, DV and FM repeater list functions. And there's an SD card slot for voice and data storage, available Bluetooth module and Android app. 
and a whole lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode and register to win. Sign up. Good luck. And don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And one more thing I want to tell you about. You may have, well, you may have seen a little preview uh, back during Tokyo Ham Fair of the IC705. It's a new QRP rig that ICOM is about to come out with. Well, we're going to have a sneak peek this Friday night um, over at live.amateurlogic.tv. Ray is coming here to the studio, and he's bringing, uh, well, it's actually a pre-production model of the IC705. It hasn't hit the streets yet. And this is, well, I think it's probably the first one uh, in the U.S., and he's going to bring it here, and we're going to look at this Friday night uh, around 8 p.m. Central 0200 UTC. If you're looking for uh, more information on it, well, join us there. Now, it's not going to be a real long stream there. It's just going to be, well, that part's going to be kind of brief. We're going to shoot a comprehensive video on it, but, you know, since Ray hasn't had his hands on it very long and it's, uh, still brand new. We'll be figuring out things. So we're, we'll at least show a little something, though, around 8 o'clock on Friday night and give you some more details of it and some first impressions with hands on it right there. So join us live.amateurlogic.tv, Friday, 8 p.m. Central O 200 UTC. And now let's get Amanda in here for the chat room. And Amanda, you are you're taking over Ham Nation next week, aren't you? Stand by, George. I might have an emergency traffic an announcement here. That's right. Mm-hmm. I'm copying it on my HT here. I am. I'm listening. Hmm. That's right. We have Ladies' Night coming next week. Can you believe that? Copied right here. We're going to wow. have a great show, everybody. Uh, we've got Valerie. We've got uh, Tamitha. And I'm not going to tell you who else is going to be on because I'm going to wait for you all to join in and see who's going to be there. It's going to be a huge night. And we've been working really hard on this show. And uh, I, I think you guys will all be thrilled. So guys and gals, tune in next week because we've got a spectacular one uh, on, the, on the line for you. Um, with that... Well, let's talk some AM. Uh, George, do you ever get on the AM during the AM rally? Um, I think I have probably been on during the AM rally before. Uh, I have not done real well there. I don't know for what reason I haven't been on. It's probably, um, I've got bad noise here right now. I've got to figure out where that's coming from and get rid of it. But I do operate AM occasionally, and I like the mode. I, I really need to be on it more. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's a fun mode. It's a little different. You ought to check it out. If you've never done any AM before, well, tune around there in the AM windows this weekend. Do a little All listening right. and, yeah, punch that button on AM and make a few QSOs as well. You'll be surprised. At, you know, uh, it, it's just different than single sideband, not only the way it sounds, but you know, the type of conversations that go on there. It's um, a really nice group of folks. Very good. Now, um, Gordo, same question to you, but I'm going to add a little bit more to it. Um, Bill, WZI1L, excuse me, had asked, what is the separation in the AM band? Do you do three uh, hertz or do you do six hertz in separation? And do you play on the AM rally as well? Um, yes, I'll be on uh, AM on uh, 75 meters, and I've got it right here. The ICOM 9100 is poised for action this uh, uh, coming uh, contest. Well, it's not really a contest. It's just a 
fun operating event. And I try and stay uh, about six kilohertz away. But uh, as I'm tuning around, I'll simply tune around where I'm not hearing uh, either their upper sideband, if I'm on the high side of them, or the lower sideband of their double sideband signal. So if I don't hear them, they probably won't hear me. And the best part of AM is to listen to some of those stations that sound just like a major broadcast station on the old AM radio. So I'll be there, but I'll be doing a lot of listening as well on AM. That's great, Gordo. Uh, and we speak of AM. Let's uh, also talk about our shortwave station, WTWW, who is showing us this, uh, playing it for all of their listeners right now. And maybe some of their listeners might tune in as well. Not that you can talk if you're not a ham radio operator, but hey, listen in and see what, uh, what you can hear. And um, one other question I wanted to ask is I wanted to ask Bob was to go over the AM windows again. So Gordo, you want to take that? Um, I don't have them memorized, and I have a feeling that uh, because there's going to be so many stations on, that um, our, our AM stations will be taking each side of what is known as the uh, AM window on uh, 75 and a little bit on 40. Um, I encourage those uh, running double sideband, uh, be patient when uh, someone comes back on. oh, my God, you got a big carrier on the air. And you just lean in there and say, that's to keep the noise down. And <laughs> <laughs> they'll do fine. And for those of you that uh, on uh, single sideband uh, tuning in an AM station, uh, many folks will find that phase distortion on a couple of hops of AM uh, uh, going through the ionosphere um, will cause one sideband to slightly distort and the other one to be clear. If you're on double sideband, uh, you'll hear a little bit of that kind of fading in and out. So just go over to single sideband on receive and pick the sideband of your choice and you'll probably have some great reception this weekend. Amanda? Very good, Gordo. Now, you um, you talked about at uh, Quartz Fest how you taught about tropospheric ducting. What else radio-wise did you actually do? Did you get on the air and make some contacts and have some fun oh. or what? <laughs> Uh, we did. We had some fantastic uh, helpers at the W7Q station. When I say helpers, these are mentor hams, many with the extra class ticket, that just went overboard to help brand new hams learn about all the excitement on HF. And we had some real pileups, and um, you'll see some of the antennas that we were using. And uh, they all came through great on the ICOM transceiver. And everybody had a wonderful time. So that was the best part, Amanda, of Quartz Fest. I mean, the radios were good and oh, look at all those antennas. But the best part are those folks that come up and you meet them and you hear just a little bit about uh, their background. And it's amazing all the hams and all the experience they bring to about a 50-acre uh, uh, area at Quartz Fest. It was just fun meeting all these fellow hams. Very good. And um, I told Randy, we may need to uh, work on uh, trying to drag our camper down there, but we'll see how that works out. Um, and I have a comment for Randy. So Randy, if you're watching this evening, 80PO wanted to say, Kelly wanted me to sure, be sure and tell you how much she enjoys your walk arounds with interviews like the video that you showed us this evening. So thank you very much, Randy. We really appreciate it. All right. With that, Let's uh, go over the nets that we're going to have tonight. We have uh, 14, Charlie on D-Star, DMR is 31.012, and 75 meters on 39.05. And Kevin, KC7 um, FPF will be back on with us next week on 40 meters. So thank goodness for that. Thanks, Kevin, for and thank you for everybody for being patient, waiting for 40 meters to come back on the on the air. And I'm glad he's gotten all settled into his home and got his new ham shack up and running. So thank you, everyone. But I do for have the AM tonight. window. Oh, you do. Go I ahead, do have George. the. Well, I believe Bob said it is 3870 to 3890. 
on 75 meters. Now, if you look on the internet, you're going to come up with some some different information there. 3870, I think, more leans toward the West Coast, but anywhere in that range, 3870 to 3890 is usually occupied by AM signals. And if you operate sideband, now be considerate, stay out of that area. And if you operate AM, kind of narrow yourself down to that area. Don't don't get outside of that. And everybody can get a, get around it. But I heard uh, some sideband guys, uh, some some friends, talking about it one time, and they said, you know, you really don't want to go down there and mess, uh, you know, with the AM guys uh, <laughs> with your sideband signals, because some of them are running. Um, such big stuff that if they wanted to camp out where you are, then, you know, <laughs> that would just, that would be it. I mean, so, yeah, everybody play along together. I don't know in the um, the the other bands exactly where the AM windows are. I see what the uh, ARRL says here. 40 meters, uh, let's see, they say 7290 to 7295. I'm not sure that everyone agrees with that. But anyway, it just listen in those areas. You're, you're going to find some AM signals. Just do a search for uh, AM window, and you'll get some, some good locations that way as well. Amanda? I agree. And I, I would also say, if you're nervous about calling CQ for the AM rally, just answer everybody else's calls. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be plenty out there that you're going to be able to pick up in here. So if you're worried about um, anybody getting mad at you for operating in the wrong place in the band, just uh, peckin', peckin' hunt, pounce and hounds, whatever they call it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for being here this evening. We appreciate this. Thanks for all of Bob's wonderful guests. Uh, we really had a fun time. And now we've all gotten encouraged to get on AM this weekend. So I I better hear your reports next week and uh, should be on the chat room telling me how many contacts you made. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Have a lovely time. Good luck this weekend. 73. Bye.